Um, and we have a mic runner here. I'm going to give this one to. And again, if you have a question, if you can hold on until they get to you, just so everyone can hear. Um, Sky, for anyone who isn't aware of why you're here, if you can explain who you are, why you're here, and what you do now, and then we go into the questions. So. Yeah, so I was basically raised in Klamath Falls. I um, moved here when I was very young, went to Conger Elementary School, then to Ponderosa, and then to KU. And then when I graduated KU, I ended up moving going to college in uh, Seattle and then kind of lived on pretty much every state on the west coast except for Hawaii. Um, I live in Los Angeles now. I uh, do a number of different things. I'm predominantly a documentary filmmaker, but I also work as a director of photography on a couple of TV shows, on independent films. I do scripted work as well as non-scripted work, and I'm in the process of developing more kind of true crime documentaries similar to this one. So. Um, We'll see what happens in the future. Yeah. Uh, I guess questions too. Just yeah, there's one. Hi, how long did it take you to do research this, right? Yeah. How long did it take you to do that and then get into scripts and then to get into production? It's been uh, from the moment I started to right now, it's been about six years. Uh, the film itself took about three years uh, to get it made, uh, maybe a little longer, three and a half years, and it was really sort of six months at the beginning to do research and finding out the story and tracking down the people and talking to them and getting them to, you know, see if they wanted to talk and tell their story, and then um, various different periods of production where we would go out and do interviews with people and then come back and edit things together. Uh, we were doing quite a bit of research too. We got the FBI documents kind of in the middle of that process and then learned a lot from getting those documents and then had to go back for a second round of interviews after that. Um, but it was kind of a combination of filming, fundraising, editing, filming, fundraising, editing for about three years. And then we were on the festival circuit for a year and a half um, up until January of 2015 when it, funnily enough, too, Netflix actually purchased the documentary in January of 2018, and so we knew we had a year more before they were going to air it on their platform, and so we took that year to do as much sort of um, public screenings in theaters and festivals as we could, because I think it's a really great experience to, to be able to watch it in a theater um, and to have these interactions with people to be able to talk about the film and to be able to talk about people's reactions to it and, and that's been honestly it's been one of the most incredible elements of the whole experience to me is is to be able to share it with, with a live audience yes um th those were just incredible interview that was kind of jaw-dropping interviews so i just wonder um did you do the interviews you really got people both the, the fbi guy and the parents um were just um those were people that was incredible. Yeah, well, thank you. Yes, I, I did do the interviews. It was, um, they were brutal. Yeah. I mean, they were brutal. They were long, you know, they were eight to ten hours long, each of them, really. Um, with Pete, the FBI agent, uh, we talked to him for two days straight, and they were both eight or ten hours long. Um, multiple interviews with the parents, and um, I think it was really, I mean, I think it, they were very ready to tell their story. Um, but they never talked about their sexual indiscretions before. They left it out of the book, and they never really talked about that publicly. And I'd known about both of them before going into the interviews. Um, Jan's mom had talked about the affair before. We, she knew, we knew, we talked about it. Her dad had never said anything, but I found out about it through some of the FBI documents. And so going into that, I really had no idea whether or not I was going to ask him about it or not because I knew he held it very, very close and, uh, and it was a secret that he had been carrying around for a long time. So my approach to the interview was to try to get him to to volunteer himself without me asking about it kind of going and trying to come in kind of side door. And and it worked. And when he when he talked about it it was it was incredibly emotional. Did you have permission from them prior to the did they um, sign releases. Did they yeah. sign releases prior, and what did they have to talk about? They signed releases prior. Um, we did. We had planned to do a screening with them uh, once it was all finished, just kind of a, a family screening. And I had it all planned where I was going to drive out to um, St. George, Utah, and do a screening. And then somebody in the family passed away, and they had to go to a funeral, and it never happened. 
And the timing of it was interesting because we were in a festival in St. George the next weekend. So we never had the chance to kind of sit down with them in an intimate setting. So the first time they saw it was in a theater full of 300 people. <laughs> I was like, how are they going to feel about this? And Bob came up to us afterwards, and he was he said, I'm just so grateful. Thank you so much for telling our story with the sensitivity and with the truth. And, um, and really just was so grateful. And I was, I was, they constantly amazed me. I mean, in every single direction you could possibly imagine, they constantly amazed me. Yeah. <laughs> yes, not not the profits from the film, but the profits from the book. That so, uh, stolen innocence is the first book, and some of the profits are going to help the book, the next book get published, the second round of the book get published, and so they're rewriting stolen innocence to include some of the affairs and to, to elaborate a little bit on the stories, and so no. profits. Huh? Not anything from the film. Nothing from the film, no. Yeah, but from the book, the prophets will go. I think of 30% of the prophets or something from the book. You said you sold the film. Yes. So, uh, no, I don't have control over how. I have somewhat control of it. Um, the majority of, of what it was sold for went to pay back the costs of the film. So there's not much left. No, no, it was really um, it was really the story. One of the producers, Stephanie Toby, uh, found the book, and the book, the Brobergs had self-published the book, so it hadn't really gotten a very wide release. Um, but she had found the book, they had a mutual friend, and Stephanie hadn't done a lot of documentary work before, and she knew that I had. We did work together on a previous project, and she came to me and she says, this is something you'd be interested in working on. And I read the book, and I just couldn't understand how something like this could happen, how someone could get kidnapped twice. And the book didn't really clarify any of that to me. So I, I just thought the story was incredibly interesting and, and really, I mean, it's somewhat selfish, I guess. I really wanted to figure out how something like this could happen. And that's, that's really what drove me the entire time. Yeah. Have you um, met with him recently with all the new actions on social media and how mean people are about this whole thing? Yeah, people have been incredibly mean about it. I've seen, uh, I haven't talked to Marianne. Bob passed away in November of, 20, of last year, 2018. So um, he passed away before a lot of the social media world sort of exploded with negativity towards him. Um, I've talked to Jan, and um, she's handling it pretty well. And she and her sisters were trying for a long time to kind of protect Marianne. I mean, Marianne's not on Twitter, you know, and Twitter's probably. Just, I think um, YouTube's pretty hard. I mean, there's all they're all kind of harsh. Oh, Facebook. Facebook's pretty harsh. Yeah, they're all kind of harsh. Yeah. Um, yeah. So okay. So a lot of people um, have been using social media to really kind of blame the parents for what happened, and um, I, think it's, I think it's even beyond blaming because I think a certain amount of of of, of critical assessment of the parents is is healthy. Um, but they've been really cruel and saying things like they should burn in hell and so that they're stupid and even gone so far as to say that the Rovers um, trafficked their daughter, that there was something very uh, very intentional about what they were doing and, and knew what was going on in trafficking their daughter. I personally don't believe that to be true at all. Um, but they've been they've been responding to it okay and I know that I know that Jan and Susan talked to Marianne at one point, and Marianne said, I'm okay. You know, I we've been telling this story for a long time. People, this isn't the first time. It's the first time that social media has been the way that it is. But they've always got people saying, it was your fault and blaming them. And so, and they were prepared for that. Maybe not to the extent that they've received it, but they were somewhat prepared, and she told them, she said, I'm okay, go and do it. And, and the girls kind of took that as their sign to kind of keep marching forward and sharing their story. And the intention behind it is that hopefully they can, their story can help save someone's life. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, obviously, it's, it's like an extreme case, but as you stream to other people, 
Texas. Well, if you can share the story with us, you know, and we can kind of rebut on some of the things that you're saying. The amount of people have said, how many of the people have something similar to this? Is it close, or is it, I mean, maybe not as extreme, but I mean, thousands. Yeah, but the thing is, it's like, you know, that's where a backlash you may get on this. So it's like, you know, maybe this story isn't such a isolated incident as you may think. Right. Because, you know, a lot of us sometimes grow up maybe in good Christian homes and everything. And, you know, in some ways that's a little bit like the picketed, protected fence. Right. You know, and, and it keeps you away from all the bad stuff in the world. And so when the roof creeps in, I would say in a lot of religions. Mm -hmm. No, I, I think that's true. There's a lot of brainwashing in a lot of religions around the world. I'm not saying that that means like they're all wrong, but I'm just saying that it is easy. This is not an isolated thing. It's just a price of many people in the backlash. This is, doesn't this happen a lot more? I mean, I four actually out of think, ten women. Yeah, I women actually think that's why they're backlashing. I think there's that denial, and you see it play yeah. out. I mean, you see it play out so well on the screen. And, and we've all experienced <laughs> denial in, in some form or another, maybe not to this extent, but I think that's part of the backlash that everybody says, I, I'm too smart, this could never, I would never let this happen. And they don't, and they can't quite sort of, I don't know, take that step back and kind of see, see, see how it happens, I guess. I mean, really, we all ask ourselves, maybe it needs to happen to us, but how many of us know somebody that it might happen to? Yeah, and I mean, if you look around, I don't think it yeah. See that this is more prevalent. Right. In fact, that's one of the things I kind of wish, you know, like our education system here. It's like, in some ways, we've got to educate the kids about how the world can take advantage of them so they can protect themselves. Right. A lot of kids are, it's their innocence that is played against. Right. I don't know what the right answer is. I know. Maybe a few more bandits don't realize that in the 70s, mm -hmm. life was way different than right. it the is context. in 2019. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot more. I mean, my mom was raised way differently than I was. More naive, more trusting, trusting. more, you know, he was their next door neighbor. He right. was basically their friend who became an uncle. I mean, in the picture, did you see how Jan's hand was on his leg? I hand? know. Yeah. And how Marianne was sort of reaching out yeah, too. And, and so they like, trusted him. They felt like he was one of their own. And he just basically brainwashed them because he was mentally ill himself. And I think, but I think that's what happens more commonly than what we're willing yeah. to admit yes. as well. Is that it's it's happening with people that we know, love, and trust. It's not happening with strangers. It's not strangers. It's ninety-five percent. I think is the statistic. Yeah. Of I think it's like ninety-seven. It might be or something yeah, like huge. that. But it's somebody that you know. Yeah. Whether yeah. it's a friend, a neighbor, an uncle, a cousin, it's yeah. It's only three, less than three percent that it's a stranger. Yeah, exactly. I'm gonna call you and then I'll come to you. Okay. Yeah. So how did you manage the emotion for yourself? Because I get into situations where I talk about the people who were absolutely devastated. I just have to hold them to it. But how did you manage that for you and your family? Yeah, it it, it ranged um, how I managed the emotions after the interviews. Uh, it was quite different than during the editing process. After the, inter the interviews, we'd go back to our hotel room and throw, I would throw myself back into work because I had the interview the next day. And so I'd kind of go into the questions and figure out, you know, kind of look at downloading the footage and kind of, you know, go back through the day and figure out what we had and where those things existed and kind of log that, think about the questions that were happening the next day. So it really was to kind of not think about the emotion, kind of get back to work with it. It changed substantially during the editing process because that's when I I got to be kind of the social media people at times. You know, I was like mad at them and and angry and couldn't understand things. And then I'd, I'd swing to the other opposite end of the spectrum and get, you know, have a lot of empathy for them. And so really went through the gambit of things to the point where I, I didn't feel anything um, for anybody film and that's when it was really important for me to take a break from it and uh, both my editor and I were just kind of like so we just wanted to be done with the film so badly and we weren't quite there and we weren't making any real great progress forward and I said let's take a break from it and we stepped away for a couple of months and, and went and did something completely different and then came back to it 
and had just a very different perspective on things and were able to kind of feel the emotions that I think we needed to feel and kind of track the trajectory of how we wanted people to be feeling about them in this film. So, um, but it's tough. I mean, there were a lot of nights when I was laying in bed just kind of thinking about all of the different ways that, that, that we could take the story and what that effect, what effect that would have on the family and audiences and the message that we're trying to get out. And and it's it's a pretty huge responsibility, you know, to put out a film like this um, into the public and have, have people sort of watch this family and judge them. And um, so there's a lot of talk that I put into, into that as well. Anyone else? Yeah. How did you get to Netflix? Did you search them out or did they see Film festival coming by you. Yeah, so we um, it happened through a film festival, um, and we had met somebody at a film festival in Wichita, Kansas, of all places. Like it didn't happen in some, didn't happen in Los Angeles, didn't happen in New York, Chicago, any of the big cities. We were at a film festival in Wichita, Kansas, and um, somebody who was at the festival saw the film and fell in love with it, and he had a connection at an agency in Los Angeles, a creative artist agency. And he said, do you want me to make an introduction? I said, yeah, that'd be great. So he introduced us to an agent there. And we met with them. They watched the, the film. They loved it. And then they are the ones that took it out to Netflix. And initially, Netflix, that was October of 2017. And Netflix originals had said no. But that the um, just the acquisition team said, we may want it, but we don't know what our budget's going to be until 2018. So I said, well, wait. I don't care. Let's wait the three months and see what Netflix has to say. So we waited those three months, went back to them, and they said, absolutely, we want it. We're interested. Mm -hmm. Can't do it until 2019. And we said, okay, that's fine. So that's kind of it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I would just like to thank you. I, I see now the kind of really importance of documentary filmmaking because for me, if the homosexual encounter hadn't occurred with a dad, nothing makes sense. I know. Nothing makes sense. But with that, in a lot of instances, community, it really makes sense. Yeah, they are all shamed, and they all have to be wrong about this stuff. It's really manipulated them in an incredibly magical way. So kudos to you. Oh, thank you, thank you. It, made, it was the one piece of the puzzle for me too that just fit, and then everything else kind of went from there. So thank you. Yeah. Any other? Yeah. This kind of documentary allows us to see this as a, a problem that permeates all in life, you know. Really, it's not about any particular thing you want to do. Um, this is a true example, but so what, what do you do to your research? I, you know, I'm, I've been, I'm constantly amazed at what just talking about it does and what watching a film like this. I've had people come up to me from an audience and tell me something that has happened in their past that they've just talked about for the first time in their lives. Um, and experiencing that with a group of strangers in a theater gives one voice power. And I think, especially sort of what's going on now with, with women and talking about sexual assaults in a much more open way, knowing that we're not alone, um, there is power in numbers, and there is power in speaking about it, sharing your story, and and so I think that there are a lot of I think that there are ways if somebody's going through something like this, talk to a friend, talk to a therapist. There are many support groups. There's the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. There's Rain. There are all sorts of support groups online that you can go to. Um, there are many many resources out there, and more than anything, talk to a friend and. Um, and have a, and know a friend that's going to listen and just be able to share your stories, and that's what I think is kind of the best thing to do. Yeah. Do you think there's something like specific in communities that are maybe absent in quarantine or organizations that you can reach out to? There are a lot of national organizations that you can reach out to. There are a lot of support hotlines that you can reach out to and talk to, and um, that are completely confidential. Mm -hmm. I think in any community where there is nothing in the community, there is a national hotline that you can reach out to. And they're they're incredibly helpful. Yeah. yeah. I have two questions. Um, one is, what's Jan doing today, or like, did she get married and have children? And 
second, um, there were a lot of uh, tapes from that period of time. Did the family keep them? Or? That was, we got those from the FBI. Okay. So they, had, we, and we were really, I was so, we were fortunate to get those tapes because up until that point in time, really all we had was a handful of pictures of Birchfield, and getting those tapes was really critical for us to kind of get some deeper insight into who he was. Um, and your question about Jan, she, uh, since the documentary has come out, she's been getting a lot of attention. She's been doing a lot of interviews and um, is, is kind of taking this opportunity and hoping to be able to get out there on a more national scale to spread her story uh, in a personal way, to go into speaking engagements and to talk about various different things. She is starting a, I think has started a nonprofit um, to have women uh, it's called the Songbird Project, and they're going and, and will eventually be going and telling their stories. It probably won't be her everywhere, but to, to gather a group of women who have similar stories of survival, and they will be going across the country and sharing their stories. She's she struggled, I mean, in a big way. She's She's been married four times. Um, they've always been to abusive men in, in some way or another. Um, they've also, they've all... They've been addicted to alcohol. They've been um, violent men. Um, they haven't been that much older. That's, that's a great question. Yeah, um, they've been a little bit older, but but a reasonable sort of range, you know. Um, but the marriages have always happened very quickly, and they've ended very quickly. And um, and she recognizes that. One thing that she told me. Uh, is, and this was really devastating, is that she's always searching for that love, the way that she felt with virtual in all of her relationships. And every time that relationship doesn't give her that, it's over. And so, so she is, for the most part, judging her current sort of relationships with men based on how she felt as a 20 year old, 14 year old. She has one, one child from her first marriage. She's in his 20s, 20, he's 27, 28 right now. Um, and he's he's doing well, he's, he's struggled too. Um, it's hard for him, you know, to experience this. Uh, I think harder for him, really, than, than anybody else in the family, really, because it's it's tough to see your mom go through this. And she's, she loves him, you know, to bits, and she's always been very open with him. and, and both of her sisters have families and children, and I asked all of them the question, you know, how do you, how do you raise a family after having gone through this? And, and the thing that they always come back to is we talk to them. We talk to them, we talk to them, we talk to them, all the time, we talk to them. So, yeah. So, talking to his brother, mm -hmm. how did he not know? If you truly believe he didn't know, there were seven girls. He knew. He knew the whole time I, about all seven of them? Well, no, I don't think he knew about all seven of them. But, like, the way that he views this relationship to this moment in time is different. Like, he sincerely believes that they loved each other. He knew his brother was a pedophile. He knew he liked little girls. But he believed that they loved each other. And even now, he will email me and say, Jan's lying to you. She went with him intentionally. And I'm like, okay, yeah, she did go with him intentionally, <coughs> but she's 12. Yeah. yeah. She's she 12. A, child to trust him. Be, but a dad figure. Right, right. Did and you talk to any of his other siblings? They didn't want to talk to us. So um, we, we reached out to Gail, his ex wife, and we reached out to uh, the children. And I was able to get Gail on the phone for about 30 seconds before she, she hung up on me. Um, but, but basically, and I understand it, she said that she wanted to leave it all behind her and that she doesn't want to bring this up again. Um, I'd be fascinated to see how they feel now because I'm sure, I'm sure somebody in the press has found them and reached out to them and tried to, to find out how they feel. Did you talk to the sister, the little sister that he said started it all, that he needed a little sister to take care of, a little child to take care of? No, she wouldn't talk to us either. Yeah. 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 So what did happen to Gail? Was she married or was she 
they they were divorced and she never remarried. No, she um she raised the kids and um they still live in and around the Ogden area. And Joe spends quite a bit of time with them. He goes out hunting with the eldest son regularly, um, and and they're very close with Gail and they're very close with Joe. So there's still been a family unit that's there. Yeah. Uh, since you say that you have hours upon hours of interview footage in the course of filmmaking stuff reluctantly asked of him to come in with more, so mm -hmm. what are some of the most shocking things that came out of interviews that did not make the film? Okay, I think the most shocking, and it was really hard to cut it out, was that before the first kidnapping, um, Birch told had, had gone down to Mexico driven down to Mexico to adopt a little girl. Yeah, and managed to adopt her. Um, and there was audio tape of it, of him sort of talking about, I, I call these as like audio journals of him talking about picking out a little girl. And um, so he picked out this little girl and, and took her and brought her back and she was taken away from him at the border. And, and so that was something that was incredibly shocking just very creepy, and we wanted to keep it in, but to kind of weave it in, just didn't, just didn't work. Oh, she was a teenager. She was 11 years old, 12 years old, when it was somewhere. So, so, and then it was, you know, I, I remember talking to Marianne about it. She had told this portion of the story too, and how she had talked to Gail because Gail had known he was going down, and Gail was like, "I don't, I, I've got these kids. I don't need." five kids, I don't need any more kids, why is he going down to adopt this little girl? Um, and I actually believe that, part, I have no evidence to this, but I believe that the divorce with Birchtold and Gale happened just about the time when the youngest, which was a little girl, was getting about to the age that there might be abuse start to happen, and that's when I think she started to kind of go, I'm not going to, I'm not going to this out. Because were there other children? Four, four boys, and then one girl was the youngest. Yeah. Did you talk to any of the other six victims? We uh, we reached out to we could find information on four of them. Uh, we found information on three of them. Uh, they did not want to talk to us and tell their story. And then one contacted us, and and it was a really critical time because. Uh, I had always kind of not been completely sure about the aliens, if the aliens were true. And and then I even got to a point where I was like, I don't really care if they're true because if this is her coping mechanism, that's fine. And this is what, you know. Uh, but this woman had contacted us before the filming got out, before we were cutting it, before anybody knew we were making this movie, when we had like a website. And she had been researching Jan Roberg and she contacted us and she told us a story of having been raped by Virgil for years and 10 years. And he, for the longest time, used the story of her being an alien princess. And, and the way that she told us the story, it was almost verbatim what Janet had told us. And that, I was like, holy cow, like there's no way these women had never talked to each other or anything. So, so that was, was to me, I kind of, my moment to go, oh, okay, I, I believe that at least a portion of this happened. So her very last line of the film, where she says uh, the, the person that she would want to forget about and never think about again is the person that she thinks about every day. Mm -hmm. Of course, we all kind of interpret what she means by that. But had she elaborated with you um, that process of what happens with her when she's thinking about that every day? It gets she, she yeah she talks she talks a lot uh, and it's this great sort of philosophy of life is that she lives in the 90%. The 10% of her life was this man and this horrible experience and that you can choose which part of your life to live in. So you can live in the 10% that was awful and him and this moment in, in, in the day that she thinks about him or you can choose to live in the 90%. And she says she chooses to live in the 90%. And it's, it's amazing to me because I'm, I mean, Jan's capacity for forgiveness is greater than anybody I've ever I mean, you look at the forgiveness that she's given to her parents and to uh, to Birchfield, even to a degree, and to pretty much everybody that she meets. 
And so, so it's it's really I think her process of how to live her life and to just kind of. I mean, there's the other edge of the point too, where you can say, you know, is she denying this part of her life? And then I kind of go, deny it or not. I don't believe she is, or else this film would never have been made. Um, so that's really, I think, that it, it comes into her life, especially now, especially since the film kind of came to Netflix and she's doing a lot of interviews and talking and, and, and potentially trying to, to, to formulate another career as a more speaking circuit. But um, but she kind of just pushes it aside and doesn't get it just a few more minutes if we can take one or two more questions. Yeah. I thought it was really strange when it was a stalking hearing. And that was him right at the table. Four feet away from her? Yeah. <laughs> I can't believe. And did he, did he have a lawyer? Why was that allowed? It seemed like a very casual yeah. hearing. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was a hearing for a restraining order. Um, I have no idea. Like I, I was shocked by that too. Like, how can you sit four feet away from from this person? Um, and that was to get the restraining order. And but it was a very informal sort of restraining order hearing. And further apart, yeah, like with the lawyers on, between them. Yeah, just I know. A little. I mean, they were right next to each other. I know. I know. Yeah. Yeah. But he had chosen to represent himself on that. So. Oh. Okay. Yeah. And then his whole like conversation with her changed as soon as she stood up for herself. Yeah. Yeah. As soon as she showed up presence in a document. Yeah. Like recoil. Yeah. Because I don't think he's ever experienced that from the family before. And 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 seeing that it's funny because we, we came up across that court tape quite late in the edit and Jan sort of told the story and she tells it in a in a really impactful, emotional, powerful way. But watching it sort of play out in the courtroom was so much more powerful, and seeing her actually sort of face him was was just amazing. Yeah. You've been a person of that admiration since you were in TV. Thank you for bringing so much pride to this little town. Thank you. Um, I always look thank up you. To you. Oh, thank you so much. Thank that's, you, and I just want to say thank you. That's so kind. She thank told you. me the story of the car, so <laughs> <I didn't laughs> that's what you said to you. With that, Thank I think you. we should wrap it up. But yeah. you, afterwards? Oh, yeah. Where are we going? Pikey's? Pikey, I think. Is yeah, okay. Point. Cool. So so we're going to go to Pikey's and have a drink. Um, anybody who wants to keep the conversation going or not, we can talk about anything else. We don't have to talk about this. Um, but please, we're, <laughs> we're going to head over there now. And so please come and, and join us for, for a drink. Love to see you. Thank you. And thank you, Jesse.